So yeah, thanks for joining us. Uh, tonight we've got uh, Jonathan Schaefer Goddard. He's a graduate of the University of Oxford, Oxford Brooks, and the, the New York University School of Law, specialist in commercial litigation, the laws that applies to shipping and technology and other interesting subjects like that. And he's agreed to come along, talk to us tonight about his experiences at the bar and uh, the bar in an international context. So if there's nothing else from me, Jonathan, I'll happily hand over to you. Wonderful, that is a, a short, sweet and swift introduction. Thank you very much. Um, it is wonderful to meet you all. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I've always been a massive uh, fan of the Open University, uh, having both competed against um, uh, members of your law program in Moots when I was a student, and then uh, judged members of your law pro program in uh, Moots later on. Um, I've always I, been. I feel I feel compelled to ask the first question all a little early, but how did you do against our, our law society members? I I did win, um, okay. but it was actually quite hard fought. Uh, and I and I, I've always been tremendously impressed uh, by the guys at Open University when I've judged them. Uh, so I will be saying more that. about mooting, but I, I I come with a great deal of sort of a, a goodwill towards the Open University and really quite um, quite delighted to be asked to speak to you. I'm well, going well, to well done on turning the audience against you in the first few minutes with the. Is <laughs> 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 that a record? Do you think? <laughs> yeah, probably, probably. <laughs> Anyway, no, sorry, I, I interjected. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. I, I, I'm going to speak about uh, a few topics briefly with a view to sort of opening us up for uh, discussion and questions so you don't just listen to me prattle on. Um, so that you have a basic uh, idea of the route I'm going to take. I'm going to say a little bit more about uh, myself for 30 seconds. I'm then going to talk about the route to the bar and particularly the commercial bar, much of which I'm sure you've heard before. So I'm not going to linger there. I'm then going to talk about international practice and the opportunities for international practice uh, across the bar, but uh, focusing in particular on what I know, which is the commercial bar. Uh, and then I'm going to look a bit about, I'm going to talk a bit about the future of transnational disputes from an English perspective and uh, what I see there. And then I'm going to talk briefly about uh, dual qualification, uh, foreign legal study and foreign legal practice. And as I think has been mentioned briefly in the in the pre-discussion, I am currently sitting in New York, which is why I'm bathed in sunlight. The weather here is a balmy 70 something in Fahrenheit. Uh, I've given up trying to work out what that is in Celsius, but uh, warm would about summarize it. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about what I'm doing in New York and, uh, and those opportunities. But I'm gonna go through the sort of swift canter uh, to give space for uh, discussion, et cetera, afterwards. And I'm going to leave that to the end. So I'm going to run through and then we'll have opportunities to pick up anything that I've talked about uh, or indeed anything else that's on your minds. So as Jonathan said, I did a non-law undergraduate degree. I then did a part-time GDL at Oxford Brooks uh, and worked full-time alongside that. Uh, I then did the bar course and worked alongside that uh, and then went into pupillage at Fort Pump Court. I completed my pupillage, uh, was offered and took a tenancy there. I practiced in chambers uh, for three or four years before taking a sabbatical to do an LLM at NYU, uh, following which I took the New York bar, uh, dual qualified in New York. And I now split my practice between London and New York. Uh, and in New York, I practiced from a firm called Holwell, Schuster and Goldberg, which is a smashing uh, litigation boutique uh, here in New York. Uh, and I've been here for, well, I've been here for almost two years now, but I've been based for HSG for about six months. That's me. That's more than enough about me. I want to talk now about the route to the bar. And I want to focus on a few things that I think are particularly important uh, because we're going to go on and talk about practice at the bar, but you want to talk think about how to get there. Um, what you're searching for, I know, is pupillage, which is hard to get. I want to give you the headline advice that I give to all people who are looking for pupillage, uh, which is when it comes to your applications, and I think this is particularly important for those who, as I was at the time, are studying and working simultaneously, who have limited opportunities potentially as a result to take on extra curriculars, or do many pupillages, et cetera, and limited time to write applications. Um, so I think that this advice is particularly relevant in that context, which is this, when you, apply for pupillage, as some of you may well have done in the, in, in the latest round or will be considering doing in the next couple of years, you should treat the written application that you fill in 
probably through pupillage gateway, I think it is, uh, as a piece of written advocacy. Uh, it is your chance in writing to persuade whoever is reading it, which is almost certainly a junior member of Chambers, who is giving up somewhere between two and four days, unpaid, to read all the applications. Uh, it's your chance to persuade that person that at least you should be given an interview, and ideally that you are a strong candidate just on paper for pupillage. And if you treat it as a piece of written advocacy, that has a number of implications. Firstly, it's something that you've got to craft with a view to persuade. And, and secondly, it's something which necessarily is gonna take time and refinement. And the best advocacy is considered, thoughtful, well-planned. And so my advice is always to focus on quality rather than quantity of applications. There is very little use putting in 20 or 25 all right or passable or even good applications when you could put in five excellent ones. And when you are applying, it is you are going to be spending a lot of time. If you're spending less than 10 hours on each application, you're not spending long enough. Uh, and that adds up very quickly, especially when you have family, work, study commitments alongside it. So I would just advise you as, you as you apply to focus your applications and go for quality rather than quantity and see it as a piece of written advocacy, written persuasion for why you should be given an interview and why you should ultimately be offered a pupillage. Link to that and link to the advocacy that you will do for yourself applying for pupillage, I wanted to give you a further bit of specific advice, which is, for those of you who are all at the Open University, I know this may be being viewed by others as well, but speaking to you at the Open University, you will be bringing your own unique, often quite extensive background to your application. You're not a spotty 21 year old, fresh out of a three year undergrad degree, who thinks that they're the best things happened to the law since Lord Denning. Uh, you may well think that you are the best things after the law since Lord Denning, but you are coming to it with a wealth of other experience. And I would encourage you to leverage that. It is unique to you, it is valuable, and it can all be turned into, into points in your favor for getting pupillage. I see it as a massive advantage to come to the bar with that prior experience, whatever it is. Uh, and really whatever it is, it can be leveraged in an explanation for why you uh, will be an excellent barrister. So I would urge you to do that and make the most of it. It's the sort of thing that ought to be highlighted, I think, in any application coming from people who, as I assume you all have, have, have had some former career, former life, uh, before embarking on your studies at the Open University and then seeking pupillage. And then finally, I'm going to say one thing which I was told not to say, but I'm going to say it is very, very important, and that is that you should do mooting. Uh, it, I've been told you've been told this before, and that's why I shouldn't say it. Um, but I'm going to tell you again because it is the most important thing I think that anyone thinking about the bar can do. You don't have to win. You don't have to come second. You don't even have to sort of do very well at it. Of course, if you do, that's marvelous. Um, but there are only so many moots and only so many people who can win those moots. What you do have to do, though, is do it. Show that you are able to do it. Show that you are able to uh, develop and use and learn the skills. Uh, that mooting gives you. And I can talk about that more later on if you want to, uh, but I would just urge you all to moot. Um, and I'll put in a plug here for uh, both the ESU Essex Court mooting competition, which I'm on uh, the advisory committee for and a big fan of, and also uh, for those of you who have not yet joined in, for Inner Temple, my end of court, and their absolutely excellent mooting society, which I'm the barrister liaison for. Uh, I can thoroughly recommend inner as an in on the basis of the mooting opportunities that, that society and the inn as a whole gives to students. I'm going to turn now away from the path to the bar and advice for pupillage, I'm sure you've heard much of that before, to the main meat of what I want to talk about. And firstly, that is international practice and the opportunities for international practice at the bar. The first thing I want to say is that whether you're interested in family law, criminal law, general civil, PI, uh, or commercial, uh, or even chancery, uh, there are massive opportunities for international practice at the bar. 
uh, in, in criminal, you can just need to look at the international courts uh, and uh, not least whatever will come out of the current conflict in Ukraine. Large numbers of members, large numbers of members of the English bar are involved in uh, in efforts in international criminal justice, and there is massive scope for that. Extradition, another obvious uh, place within criminal law or international practice. Family law increasingly has major international elements, whether that's assets abroad, whether that's the movement of people across borders in the context of family disputes, in particular international child abduction. But one parent leaves a jurisdiction with a child for another jurisdiction in a sort of uh, forum shopping attempt. Uh, that is a key area uh, in, in the English family courts. And the English courts hear, I think, hundreds now of disputes involving international child abduction, which often involves coordinating across multiple jurisdictions. And that is a major area of international practice in the context of family law. PI and travel, some of the major conflict of laws and jurisdictions, jurisdictional decisions come from uh, injuries abroad and uh, personal injury claims as the background for uh, difficult conflict of laws and uh, jurisdictional questions. You just need to look at the Brownlee decision in the Supreme Court last term, last year, uh, as an example for that. And then finally, the commercial bar, which is what I know best. I should say, Chancery Bar, offshore work, the BBI, Cayman, uh, Jersey, Guernsey are all places where British barristers regularly work, regularly appear, regularly advise, and there are massive opportunities there for international practice. But commercial. The English commercial court is respected around the world as a place to resolve disputes, and rightly so. And the result is that if you look at the caseload and the reports each year that the commercial court issues, you will see that an extraordinary number of the disputes heard in the commercial court uh, each year involve one or both or all parties uh, being outside England and Wales. Foreign parties regularly choose English law and or English jurisdiction to determine their disputes. And you can have a massively international practice and sense of international clients and disputes centered on events abroad at the commercial bar uh, without ever leaving uh, your, 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 your room in chambers. But there are opportunities beyond that, the international commercial courts, uh, particularly those opening in uh, the Gulf states, uh, and elsewhere in Singapore, these international commercial courts on which retired British judges regularly sit uh, are often, uh, are increasingly, I should say, places where the English bar finds work and where barristers uh, are to be found arguing cases uh, and advising on cases as they proceed. And then of course, there's international arbitration, which is a massive source of work for the commercial bar. And whether that is seated in London or elsewhere under English law or a foreign law, you'll regularly find barristers arguing uh, those cases in very international contexts. That is a very brief summary. I would welcome questions and discussion on any of that going forward, but I hope it paints a picture for you of the wide variety of international work that's open uh, to you as a barrister or indeed as a, as a litigation uh, focus or disputes focus solicitor. It is in that context, I want to say something about uh, transnational disputes, particularly in England, and what I think are some interesting trends in recent uh, case law and in recent amendments to the jurisdictional gateways, which I think indicate a continued and potentially increased willingness of the English courts to entertain uh, a, a wide range of transnational uh, disputes and issues. So the first is that the English courts take a very broad view of their jurisdiction and are willing to uh, take disputes between parties who have uh, not only elected for English jurisdiction, but elected for English law. Uh, and certainly in comparison to the uh, sort of personal jurisdiction rules here in the United States, there's a far greater willingness of the English courts to assert jurisdiction. And I think that is only increasing. Uh, one place of particular interest to me 
is the recent uh, revision to the rule to the jurisdictional gateways to permit a banker's trust orders and not pharmacal orders to be served outside of the jurisdiction. Uh, that amendment uh, to the rule to the gateways was uh, made by the rules committee. I think it's a good amendment, uh, but it is one that went against existing high court uh, and I think probably court of appeal case law, uh, both recent and um, somewhat older, uh, and is a major expansion of the court's willingness to assert its jurisdiction in seek in allowing parties to use UK orders uh, from the Bank's Trust or the Norwich Pharmacal form against banks, crypto exchanges, uh, anyone holding the goods of another or the or, or, uh, or, or the property of another outside the jurisdiction. That's, can, I, can I just quickly ask you a question about that? So I, I can see obviously the, the advantage of what you're talking about, especially in the, the context of cryptocurrencies and, and things of that nature. Does it kind of get in the way though of international cooperation on some of those issues? And does, does, it, does it present any sort of negative aspects in relation to cross-jurisdiction work? So I think whenever a court seeks to expand its jurisdiction and seeks to take on cases um, which are on the edges, perhaps, of traditional jurisdiction, uh, you always run into questions of power litigation, you run into comity concerns, you run into anti-suit and anti-anti-suit injunctions and all the fun that comes with that. I think the answer is that the English courts, uh, we will see that, Occurring, you know, we will, we we will, you know, we may well see uh, disputes arising where an, where an order for disclosure is made in the English courts and the local courts of the jurisdiction, wherever that may be, uh, enter an order forbidding disclosure, and the party who's been so ordered is left in a sort of limbo. The truth is, the English courts are very aware of uh, this risk, and judges do take uh, effort to be both uh, sort of accommodating. Um, so you'll find uh, bankers trust orders made outside the jurisdiction are often made in such a way so, so that there is no requirement to, to make a disclosure that would not comply with local law. Uh, that's often a rider that's added and that so if it's trying to carve out and avoid that sort of clash. And even there was a recent decision of the Court of Appeal in the context of a disclosure statute in the United States called 1782, which permits a foreign party to seek US style discovery from a for, from a US uh, party to aid foreign litigation. And the Court of Appeal um, faced with a uh, faced with a party you trying to use that to get US style disclosure in support of defamation proceedings in the UK uh, took a very measured and I would say somewhat solicitous approach to the work that the Southern District of New York, the District Federal Court, the trial court in the federal jurisdiction uh, was doing in relation to that application. So there you have foreign proceedings which will affect, which are designed to affect UK proceedings insofar as it permits evidence gathering by one party to UK proceedings in support of those UK proceedings. Evidence gathering that would not be available in the UK, but is available in the US. So it goes beyond what the UK would, would allow. And if you look at that decision, uh, which I can find the reference for when I finish speaking, you can see the English court taking real care to give the parties the scope to do that, to let the Southern District do its thing, to clearly state the views of the English court and the scope of what the English court could do, but allowing the Southern District uh, to, to move forward as it, as it wishes to. So yes, you do get these clashes, and I think it's going to be a really interesting thing going forward. Um, but the English courts I, are very good at managing them, and certainly the sort of clashes you saw maybe in the 80s, I think about Hart the Hartford Fire case of the US Supreme Court, uh, which related to various insurance disputes and um, such like in the UK, I think you're less likely to see those sorts of back and forths going because there is just much greater international judicial cooperation and, and understanding. Uh, but that makes for very interesting practice and very interesting disputes. And that's not just commercial. These issues will arise across uh, civil litigation, uh, wherever you've got a transnational element. It sounds almost like something baked into the culture of, of this sort of um, 
uh, judges and courts that you're talking about and just a shift in a shift in mentality, even if not a shift in formal rules and governance. Did, did I catch that correctly? I, 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 I would have said so. Uh, English judges have, especially sitting in, on, in the commercial in the commercial court, have always been extremely sophisticated um, practitioners and extremely who then become extremely sophisticated judges. And I don't, uh, I, I, by no means am I suggesting that uh, this sort of cooperation is a brand new thing, but it is very much evident today. And as the English courts potentially sort of extend the jurisdiction in various, extend their jurisdiction in various ways, uh, I think you will see that goes hand in hand with a good deal of thought and consideration. What becomes interesting is if you have foreign courts who uh, either weigh that differently or don't really consider it so much and the impact on UK proceedings. But that is part of what is so enjoyable about uh, international practice at the bar. Again, that, whether that's commercial or otherwise, uh, is engaging in those sorts of things, engaging with other jurisdictions, and engaging with lawyers in other jurisdictions and, uh, engage, and dealing with parallel litigation across multiple jurisdictions, potentially between uh, arbitration and litigation. Um, so I think that is, um, that, that's all very important. And then linked to that, there was a recent Court of Appeal decision on uh, the scope of third party disclosure in um, the case of Gorbachev and Guriev. Again, that was the end of last year. But again, just an extension by the Court of Appeal there of the willingness to order uh, third party disclosure against, I, my memory is a third party outside uh, the United Kingdom, where the materials within the United Kingdom, uh, that was an extension of the case law. Uh, and again, a willingness to exert sort of it to, to apply jurisdiction further than it had been before. Uh, and that goes hand in hand with the extension of bankers' trust and Norwich Farmer orders on the disclosure side. It goes hand in hand with the decision of A against C in the context of Section 44 of the Arbitration Act uh, back in 2020 which if you're interested in third party disclosure in support of foreign arbitral proceedings, you can tune into my webinar on that topic with the New York State Bar Association tomorrow. Um, pop, a, pop a link in the chat, some people may well. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting topic, I will, I, I will send a link, I will send a link round. Um, it's an interesting topic, which is the subject in part of the Law Commission's uh, review of the Arbitration Act, which is ongoing. And certainly if we're talking about international practice, uh, you can't really talk about international practice without talking about international arbitration. And in that context, the Law Commission's review of the Arbitration Act 25 years after the Arbitration Act was first introduced is a key and pivotal moment in how the English courts uh, address arbitration and address arbitration going forward. And finally, uh, we've mentioned very briefly in passing in relation to uh, Sort of the future of transnational disputes and bankers trust and knowledge pharmacal uh, crypto it's worth saying a bit more about that uh, england is i think definitively the jurisdiction in which case law is most quickly advancing in relation to cryptocurrency uh, cryptocurrency disputes are by their nature extremely international and indeed a lot of the, a lot of the force behind the um introduction of uh the change to the Norwich Pharmacal and Bankers Trust jurisdiction came from a series of ex parte cases in the High Court where Norwich Pharmacal and Bankers Trust orders were granted, often on quite different reasoning, always unopposed, uh, and there was a real need to put that on a solid footing because they were so important to crypto disputes where you can actually trace on the public chain where funds have gone after a hack or a fraud or a ransom payment uh, but don't know who sits behind that cryptographic uh, public key wallet. And you need to identify who that person is through the know your customer information that an exchange holds or otherwise. Uh, and of course, linked to that, there is the advent of the worldwide freezing order against persons unknown. Uh, you'll be familiar potentially with freezing orders, which freeze the assets of an individual. Uh, you may even be familiar with the worldwide freezing order, which does so on a worldwide basis. Again, that's an English courts imposing a, quite a wide jurisdiction uh, to seek to freeze the assets of someone wherever they happen to be, wherever the assets happen to be. But generally, those have always been made against people who are known, 
you make them against uh, Jonathan Doran, you make them against uh, Cordelia Wright, sorry, Cordelia. Um, wh wherever, your are, wherever your assets are, Cordelia. Um, what you now have, and again, this is, this, this, this is a risen in the context of push payment um, and uh, email phishing fraud, and then in the context of cryptocurrency uh, fraud and disputes, is the worldwide freezing order against persons unknown. Where the English court makes an order against persons unknown to freeze their assets. And those persons unknown are described as, as you know, the holder of wallet X or the holder of bank account Y or the person who has the mandate on bank account X, et cetera. Um, really interesting topic, really interesting uh, run of cases in the High Court uh, doing this. Um, you can read all about it in the Butterworth Journal of International Law, uh, of International uh, Banking, Law and Banking, I think it's called. I should know the name of that because I have a paper coming out on it next month in there. Uh, you'll find it on LexisNexis. Uh, and it's a really interesting area. But again, that's somewhere where you see uh, international disputes and the English court being inventive and willing to extend uh, its jurisdiction in, in new and interesting ways. Um, Can I ask you a question as, as more as a matter of appendant than anything else? Uh, part of my PhD is on the nature of expertise and uh, the difficulty of, in my context, scientific information um, being uh, being dealt with or handled by the electorate or by the judiciary or, or, or in different contexts, mm. like that, by individuals who are not really naturally qualified to to handle it. Um, yeah. I've endeavoured to educate myself on cryptocurrency any number of times, and I would say I have a, a minimal understanding of, of how. <laughs> have you found that the 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 English judiciary and that English barristers have taken naturally to to understanding how this works and and being able to grapple with it, or has it is it difficult? Um, no, I think, I think the truth is, is, is that the English legal system has taken quite naturally to it. Uh, you only need to look at uh, the work the Law Commission has been doing on um, digital trade documents. Uh, you only need to look at the work of the UK Jurisdiction Task Force on uh, cryptocurrency as property and on smart contracts, the Law Commission's consultation on smart contracts, uh, the uh, to see the very detailed thinking that's already going on in that sort of you know, overarching way. And then when you look at the, uh, at, when you look at the cases and the judgments, it is, everyone sort of understands what's going on and what these things are well enough to deal with them and to, and to make sensible rulings about them. What, what is interesting is, is, is the way in which the common law will adapt to them. Uh, you know, just th th think about the case about about the the tort of um, conversion, uh, the tort of conversion uh, in England and Wales following the decision of the House of Lords in OB G and Allen, two thousand and seven ish. Someone may, may may correct me on that, uh, but we'll go with that as the site uh, held that intangibles that you can't convert intangible property. Well, cryptocurrency is intangible, so the tort of conversion is no longer. Is not available till the Supreme Court overrules that. Now that differs from other common law jurisdictions. In California, you can convert intangibles to your heart's content and be sued for it. Uh, but in England, it's not conversion. Uh, and that means you have to find other remedies. You have uh, theories about uh, trust and holding on trust. You have theories about constructive trusts and uh, uh, and dishonest assistance and, um, and knowing receipt and all these other methods to try to establish liability for the wrongs that occur in the context of cryptocurrency. And I think the English courts, and have, and by that I mean the judges, as well as uh, the barristers who argue these cases, have shown themselves to be resourceful and inventive in dealing with them. Uh, and again, what that is, just its own, its own niche practice area to some extent. Uh, it is one where uh, I think there is a lot of work, an increasing amount of work, very international work by its nature. Um, if you if you want an example, you could do uh, you could do a little better than reading the Court of Appeals decision in Tulip Trading, and down a few months ago now, uh, where the Court of Appeal uh, held that uh, there was some uh, at least an arguable case that the developers uh, behind uh, Bitcoin Cash, I think it is, owed fiduciary duties to uh, holders of, uh, of 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 that cryptocurrency, and that relates to what is 
there'd be a massive amount of, of, of Bitcoin that's held. Um, uh, it, it said to have been lost um, where the key was, was deleted. Um, that was a very bad summary of tulip trading, I'll be honest. But there you can see Court of Appeal judges dealing with quite complex uh, factual scientific expert type issues, unfamiliar issues perhaps, and uh, dealing with it, I think, very clearly and very well. Uh, and that now is back to the High Court. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see uh, how it goes, although I suppose it may be an appeal to Court of Appeal. I've not looked to, see whether, to the Supreme Court, but I'm not seeing if that's been granted. Uh, I've talked for ages about all this. There's opportunity for lots of questions. I've seen some questions pop up in the chat already. But I just want to say something briefly about foreign legal practice and dual qualification, because that's what uh, I'm currently doing and currently pursuing. Uh, it should be apparent from everything I've just said that you can have a tremendously exciting international practice at the English bar, whether civil, criminal, uh, commercial, chancery, uh, and you can do so without dual qualifying, you can do so without leaving England, um, but certainly foreign legal practice and dual qualification is not necessary. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, I am now dual qualified in New York. I practice both as a New York attorney and as an English barrister. There aren't many of us that do that. Uh, and I would recommend uh, for those who are interested in that, thinking about it and pursuing it. I found it incredibly valuable to uh, study a, a, a foreign legal system, one quite similar, but really quite different from our own uh, here in the United States. And to see the way in which judges elsewhere have taken concepts that I'm familiar with from the from England, and which in some cases have been very much inherited from England, and have adapted them and developed them in their own way. Uh, it's tremendously interesting and tremendously um, uh, beneficial as you think about the law from your English context to have that foreign uh, input and context to compare and contrast and to place in conversation. Uh, and leaving aside sort of the niceties of, 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 of the law and what the law should be, it has been for me a tremendously rewarding experience to, to, be, to, to learn how to litigate in the United States and the ways in which litigation is just different um, and the ways in which it is similar. Uh, and the very different considerations that can come into play and all that really is particularly interesting. And if you are on this call or watching this interested in dual qualification, uh, particularly if you're interested in uh, qualification in the United States, uh, alongside your English qualification, I'd urge you to reach out to me, contact me. I'd love to, to speak more and to meet you, but I know that may be a minor interest, so I'm not going to major on it uh, here. But I would invite questions. Uh, I don't want to keep speaking. I've spoken for, I think, probably half an hour at this point. I'm going to uh, shut up and I'm going to invite you uh, to ask questions and pick up any topics that you want to. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, if anyone wants to, to raise some questions in the chat, I'll happily read them out for you. Or if you want to raise your hand, I can come to you um, and you can ask it in, in your own voice. Um, you say that you you found it really rewarding to be to be dual practicing and to have gone over to the States and, and practice there. Um, it's not a particularly probing question, but which one have you enjoyed the most? Did you, uh, do you have you really enjoyed practicing in the States? And, you know, if you had to pick one, if you had to choose one jurisdiction to practice in, which one would you choose? <laughs> feel, feel free to not answer that question now that I think about it, having asked it. I, I'm going to say I, th I'm thoroughly enjoying practicing in the United States. Okay. Um, it's particularly interesting having come from the bar to where you know where you are on one side of a split profession to be in a fused profession and to see the advantages and disadvantages of a fused profession. I found that very rewarding. It's certainly given me a much better understanding and a lot more sympathy for my instructing solicitors. Um, and I've also really enjoyed understanding better the tactical and practical considerations that go into litigating in the United States. And while some of that just doesn't translate to the UK so much, much of it does. And it's been particularly interesting. I will say I do love the life of a barrister, the life of um, picking up papers and 
heading into court often at short notice. One of my one of my favorite cases I did was a, was an arbitration, uh, one day arbitration where I got the papers on the Friday and had to argue it uh, on on the Monday, and nothing has yet beaten the thrill of that sort of high stake short notice sort of work. Uh, that said. I found it, I've been surprised by how rewarding I found dealing with uh, clients and working closely with clients and working on that back end development work that often as a barrister you just don't see. Uh, so I hope, hope that that works as, as an answer. I've dodged some of it, but so, so, I've tried to answer it and I'm aware that these hands are up. I don't yeah. want to deprive them of a chance to ask questions. It was a great, it was a great legal answer. You managed to, <laughs> to, to argue both sides. I thought it was great. Um, let me do one from the chat and then we'll go to some of those hands. Um, so uh, what was it that made you decide to practice law in New York and how did you find taking the exams overseas? Great question. I, uh, my wife is American and we had always intended um, that I'd be able to practice in the United States. And as a GDL student, I was not eligible for the New York bar automatically. If you've done an LLB, uh, you are uh, eligible for the New York bar automatically. I can't tell you I know how they treat the Open University, but I don't see there being an issue if it's a three-year LLB equivalent. Um, I, no, I wanted to do a qualify, have sought to develop and build a practice which incorporates that and makes it a, makes it a, 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 a selling point for me. In terms of the exams, I, the exam is fairly grueling. It's a two day uh, main exam with two earlier parts that run for a couple of hours each. Although one involves watching a lot of videos, which is very tiresome, I'll be honest. Um, not least because you then had to answer questions about the half an hour video you just watched. And often the question wasn't quite worded in the way the video was. And you got it wrong, you had to rewatch it. It, got, it, was, it was tiresome. Um, but uh, what I would say is, Whilst the New York bar exam is hard, um, it is not. It is not this unsurmountable bear moth that it can sometimes be portrayed to be. Uh, and it's something which, with I would have said, three months of hard study, anyone with a good LLB degree ought to be able to pass. Um, if they if they sort of really dedicate the equivalent of three months of hard study to it, potentially less. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say. I think actually the New York Bar doesn't allow um, online or correspondence LLB courses. Is that right? I, I believe so. Well, I, I thought that as you said it, and I've just had a quick search, and it looks as if that's true. I'm afraid uh, that it, that 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 they are they they don't allow GDLs. Um, they don't allow practicing lawyers who've done a GDL. So I'm not surprised by that. But what I would say uh, is that if you're able to, if you if it's something you want to pursue and want to do. Uh, the fund, uh, there is much more funding for LLMs in America than there is in the UK, uh, firstly, although they are also much more expensive, uh, but also uh, they are tremendously good fun and interesting and are things that you can, that if you, that you do to cure your deficiency, which is what <laughs> I was doing last year, I was curing my deficiency um, as a GDL student. Um, so that path is very much open uh, to people. That's a charming way of, of wording it on behalf of the, the New York bar. Uh, <laughs> Isn't it just? <laughs> I was about to come to Carolina, but she's just vanished, I think. Carolina, are you still on the chat? Would you like to ask a question? Ah, yes, good stuff. Uh, go on then, Carolina. I think you can uh, unmute yourself, can't you? Uh, I feel like some of it has been a little bit answered, but oh, am I trying to have a go anyway? Yeah, go for um, it. So um, I understand that it might be a little bit out of your knowledge but you might know something about it so i'll give it a go how do you think accessible is studying international law and jurisdictions with like if you do a bar within uh uk and then you want to uh, also study uh canadian law and jurisdictions how, how do you think how accessible would that be would it be fairly accessible nowadays as well or well, I, th I think the answer is definitely accessible if you want to go and study it um mm -hmm. and I think you'll you, you will I hope find it as enriching as I did uh when I when I was in when I was at NYU um studying US law uh the 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 the, the key is to find a way to do it 
and really that depends on on on, on what you want to get from it if what you want to get from it is just an understanding mm -hmm. then i think you will find that there are summer courses and online courses and correspondence courses which can give you that understanding and background uh quite easily if what you want is to then go and practice or or to be at least called to the bar of canada or one of the provinces of canada or or or, or one of the states of america uh, you may well find you need to go in person to study which is a much bigger commitment um but it is very much open i recommend um i recommend i recommend it to those who are interested in it uh, I can't give you details about Canada, I'm afraid, um, save mm -hmm. to say that I know there are LLM programs in Canada. I know that if you are a member of one of the inns, you can apply for the Fox Scholarship, which mm -hmm. will take you to Canada and pay your expenses and put you up and give you a place to live and some money to spend each month um, while you study an LLM. Uh, and there are plenty of scholarships uh, to get it go across to the United States both uh, for the UK and both the UK students in general, for um, particular specialisms, particular universities. Um, so whether that's the Turon or the Fulbright uh, or uh, other sort of general uh, grants and scholarships or mm -hmm. university specific scholarships, there are plenty of opportunities there and I would recommend it. Okay, thank you. Um, also just, sorry, uh, I'll Please? have a, another quick question. You might have answered it already. I might have missed it. I'm not sure. Um, have you finished your bar um, within in the UK firstly, and then moved on to uh, learning international law in US? That's right. I, I was called to the bar in England in 2017 and practiced for several years in chambers before going across to America. Mm -hmm. And I'm now I'm now admitted in New York. I've I've ticked all the boxes. I've done my pro bono hours, I've submitted affidavits, I've had you know, notaries sign things and uh, the paper's been processed and I was sworn in via Zoom um, a few months ago here. So there's no rush or pre there's no need to pressure myself with thinking, I want to learn a little bit about Canadian law, but I want to finish my bar in UK, I can just take it one step at a time, finish yeah, my yeah. bar in here and then take it from there if I, if I wish to. Definitely take it one step at a time. And if Canada is your interest, I would urge you to look into the Fox Scholarship, mm -hmm. which is open to, to all students at the Inns of Court. And I think pupils and early stage practitioners as well. I can't remember if you need to complete your pupillage to do it or not. I don't think you do. Um, it, could, it, I think, could be an absolutely excellent way to either go and work with a Canadian law firm or study an LLM in Canada. Uh, and there are several Fox Scholars who get sent across each year. So I would recommend that to you. Thank you very much. Is that a, a website? Uh, should I just? Uh, I think if you Google little... it, it should show up. Is my is my is my memory? Okay, I will do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good luck. The, the delicious irony of being sworn in via Zoom, given the defect we just discussed about the the all you students in the New York bar. <laughs> <laughs> well, quite. Um, I, 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 I speak ill of of, of 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 the New York State Bar Association or the New York State Bar. Um, safe to say that that is a delicious irony. <laughs> um, how about uh, TF? Do you have a little, a little question for us? Oh, hi everyone! Thanks, John. It's been really, um, really, really good listening tonight, and you've answered loads more than I thought. So that's great. Um, so I'm looking to study, and um, I've actually got a dual passport, which is fantastic. And recently found out that in Malta, um, they actually fund your studies. For EU law, which and they actually pay you to go to university, which is <laughs> seems like you're on candy camera. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so they give you 400 euros a month. But the, the bit that caught my eye was the fact that you know it's going to save me thousands of pounds in fees. The only catch is it's obviously not studying UK law; you're studying EU law. So what would your thoughts be? I mean, I have I have the option of going there for for my studies. Um, and, you know, as a single mother, finance finances is, is, you know, leads the way in my world. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I'm wondering what your thoughts would be, because. It's obviously got its limitations unless I was to live in Europe, I probably wouldn't use it. <laughs> 
Okay. I, I, so I, I think your, 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 your first key question is going to be the transferability of that degree. Um, mm -hmm. It may well be, especially post-Brexit, that it is not recognised as equivalent to an LLB here. And that mm. may have various implications if you come, if you just do the, uh, the, the, the studies in Malta. That may mean that you need to do a GDL um, on your return. Uh, it also, of course, is cheaper than an undergraduate degree, but still an expense and time um, and an intensive year if you do it in one year, less so if, like me, you do it part time. Um, it, it, may, it may be that that's not a problem, but you'll want to work that out. I don't know the answer to that. If you were to go and qualify in Malta and then practice in Malta, you may well be able to then transfer uh, to the UK simply by taking the new solicitor's exam or by taking the bar transfer test. Again, there are rules for foreign lawyers transferring across both solicitors and barristers. It's also different and I think have changed recently, at least for solicitors with the QLTS or whatever it's now called. Um, so, I, so I would urge you to look into that. It may well be that if you do qualify and practice in Malta or another EU jurisdiction, it is then easier um, to transfer then than after the LLB. But that, of course, comes with its own requirements and constraints. And I can't see I know much about the Maltese bar um, or what the options are for it beyond when I walked um, through the legal district in uh, Malta when I was there a few years ago. It looked very nice. Um, <laughs> Well, I've not even been there, so you know more than me. <laughs> <laughs> but I would, I, would, I would urge you before before taking um, what sounds like a, a very good opportunity, um, yeah, financial perspective, to make sure that you understand after the course of study and or after qualification what your options are on returning. Um, yeah, and and all I would say is that is that anyone who comes to the UK to the to the English bar or as a solicitor with a foreign qualification as their primary qualification will need to do some translation and explanation of that but I don't see that that will of itself especially if you, what you want to do is something that's European focused or facing in in your mm -hmm. practice be a be a be a be a major impediment uh, but those are the those are things I would urge you to consider um before before diving in um to the free study and 400 euros a month Yes, yes, I think they have charmed me and whisked me off my feet because I've totally forgot to even consider those questions. Yeah, well, th th those if you, when you have the answers to those, I think you'll be in a much better place to to make the call, and, and I wish you um, the very best of luck with it. Thank you. It, it was a it was a factor for myself as well. I mean, I'm based here in Scotland, but my my law studies were not Scots law; it was English and Welsh law because actually because I was interested in the US, and and that seemed like a more transferable jurisdiction than. Um, than qualifying in Scots law and I, I didn't fancy a career in Scots law so um, yeah I, I was mindful myself in my studies about which which jurisdiction I was going to qualify qualify mm -hmm. in. So uh, where did you go? Did uh, you I, say I, you, you? Oh sorry. Where <laughs> I, did you where did you choose? Oh I, well I, I studied with the, the University of London um, and then finished up with the OU. Um, oh so, right. Yeah awesome. indeed. Uh, how about Amelia? Oh, yeah, sorry, because Scotland have got the same opportunity, haven't they? I just thought yes. on to what you were saying. Scotland uh, also have free university. Yes, yeah, indeed. Yeah. Not, yes. not, not just Malta. is isn't monopolised by Malta, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how about yourself, Amelia? Do you have a question? There we go. Uh, hello there. Thank you very much. Uh, Jonathan, for sharing your experiences. My question is a simple one. Uh, would you be kind enough to talk about your time as a junior uh, barrister and uh, what that was like? Great question. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I always get nervous when it's a simple question uh, because you, you, nine times out of 10, it's not a simple question and it's quite complicated. This one, I can answer and I'd be delighted to. Uh, my practice as a junior barrister was a really nice mix of uh, sole counsel and lead work, of uh, general civil, what one might call knockabout county court work, uh, and high stakes, uh, high value commercial work. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I always recommend uh, my chambers for pump court as a place to, to, to do pupillage and then to go into practice. Uh, the opportunities for both uh, heavy commercial litigation and 
uh, your own advocacy work really are unparalleled um, compared to other sets. You'll find those sets which offer you very lots of work as the third junior on a big commercial dispute, um, which can be fascinating and interesting, but very little opportunity to be on your feet. And those sets which offer you five days a week running around the county courts uh, across the country, um, but very little by way of heavy um, uh, lead work. Uh, Full Pump Court offered me in my junior years the perfect combination. So, you know, I could be on a 5 a.m. train to Hull uh, to deal with a to deal with a case in the county court in Hull uh, one day and the next day be writing cross-examination notes for a nine or ten figure uh, arbitration. It was a tremendous mix of work. It gave me a mass opportunity to be on my feet uh, in the county courts, in arbitration, in high court, uh, as well as to be led in bigger disputes and to work with and learn from uh, senior silks. I, I, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, it, was, it, was, it was a tremendous uh, time, even, even in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, when I was confined to a windowless um, box room in my in in my apartment in London, with a with a which had a had a skylight, which was lovely uh, in the spring, but then in the summer meant that the room became so hot. Um, and it was already very small with a number of screens, um, not the best working environment. Uh, but I didn't dampen how much I was enjoying the range of work. And in addition to that, I'd say there's a lot of um, a lot of advice, advices, written work, pleadings, uh, and I worked across a very large number of matters uh, in a variety of commercial and general civil um, contexts. It was tremendous, and as I say, I would certainly recommend Fort Pump Court as a place to do mini pupillage, to do pupillage, and to practice. We have one in the in the written discussion here about. Um broadly speaking whether or not having not attended a, a law school in America would be a, a career disadvantage whether it would you would struggle to secure work in some way if you hadn't gone to law school in the US I think you would if you were looking to do pure US work in in in, in, in America there are sufficient differences um, that without having you know done at least an LLM um, you will struggle even with an LLM uh, and lots of experience in the UK. There are plenty of firms who say, "Well, you don't have a JD. I'm not interested," and that's because there is a very well-established path from you know undergraduate and the LSAT to the JD to your one L summer, to your two L summer, your offer. You sit your final exams. You have your your you sit your bar exam. You join the firm. Or a law clerk, or a first year, a second year, a third year, and there is a conveyor belt you go through. And people who come from, even with an LLM from a American university, are often treated with confusion. Um, that's I think particularly uh, going to be the case if you're coming without any U.S. experience. Um, that said, if what you're interested in is international arbitration, or if you're looking at transactional work. Uh, you may well find that if you're if you're qualified elsewhere uh, and have experienced elsewhere, it, it was relevant to that, and have just taken the New York bar as something that you were able to take without studying in the United States, that, that won't be an issue. Uh, but certainly, if you're looking to do litigation in the United States, um, and indeed, I think a lot of transactional work um, or domestic arbitration, you will need at least an LLM. Uh, to be taken, to be to be understood, um, to and to and to be able to sort of convince them that you understand the niceties of um, personal jurisdiction and subject matter jurisdiction and federalism and diversity jurisdiction and all these things, which uh, which you will learn uh, on a JD or on an LLM. But I should say, if that is something that you are passionate and interested about, again, there are all sorts of opportunities for funding, um, and the big price tag of an LLM does not need. Uh, to shut down the conversation before it begins. You, you've prompted my memory. There was a question I was going to ask you um, that you've, you've brought back to mind. I'm interested in, in the New York jurisdiction because I'm interested in scientific IP law. 
Um, would you be, have, be, have had that same interest for international practice and in particular for New York as a jurisdiction if it wasn't for the fact that your speciality is, broadly speaking, commercial law and, and things like that? I, I think the US-UK um, relationship means that commercial is particularly interesting for that. And I think that I would I would include IP in that in in that broad definition of commercial, um, for for what it's worth. That said, uh, there's no reason that it shouldn't be relevant for other, um, for in other practice areas. But I think the New York, London, New York, England and Wales jurisdictional links in the context of civil and particularly commercial cases is particularly strong. But you, you might not necessarily have had that same inclination if your if your discipline was different. Is that 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 correct? I I I, th I think I would have, I think there would be it would have been less obvious. Yeah. I, I certainly don't want to rule out that as a PI lawyer, dual qualification can be particularly valuable. I I I know of PI lawyers who regularly do work in the United States and for whom that is an important part of of, of their practice. I'm not going to say that's not true of, of, of criminal etc. But I do think that for me, the opportunities in the commercial context were particularly obvious and continue to be so. Uh, how about yourself, Philippe? Could you be interested in, in asking a question? I see you've got your hand up. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question about international arbitration. I was wondering if you could possibly discuss or have any views on bridges between the bar and a career as an arbitrator and uh, how best to affect such a switch. So I think the answer is that people people begin to sit as arbitrators at all sorts of different stages. Um, I think if you if you were to if you were to graph that, um, you would find that it mostly happens some point after taking silk. Uh, but I um, I know junior barristers who do sit as arbitrators. I know junior barristers under ten years call who sit as arbitrators. Certainly not full time, but who who do. Um, so it is something which you can start early on. As of these sorts, these sorts of things, the, the big question is always getting your first appointment as an arbitrator. It's not something that I've pursued yeah. at this stage. Uh, as I say, I know people who have. But generally, it's something that you do later on. And it's very common, I think, to combine uh, your practice as, a, as counsel with your practice as an arbitrator for a time, uh, what one might call double hatting, before uh, becoming an arbitrator full time. Now, that practice, has people, people international, the international arbitration community takes different views on that double hatting uh, that, that barristers often do, where they might sit as an arbitrator as well as acting as counsel in international arbitrations. But it's certainly something that happens these days. But to answer your question right now, for the most part, full, people become full time arbitrators from the bar, either after becoming a judge and retiring from the bench and thinking, that they'd like to continue doing something but can't return to practice as counsel. Um, and so become arbitrators. And you'll see that at all the commercial sets, you have these former judges who now sit as arbitrator members. Um, and uh, it's a thing uh, that people do from silk. Um, but I, as I say, there are options at the junior end, but certainly not, I would have thought, full-time options. Shall we end on a, a hard um, head? <laughs> Shall we end on a hard hitting question? So, law is a profession that's quite well known for colleagues socialising after office hours and, and things like that. Uh, London or New York, which is the better one for the better for that? Uh, London. <laughs> Fair enough. Good, good stuff. Uh, I think that's <laughs> of, our, of our question. I, I would disagree. I'm sorry to say I love New York. I've got a real soft spot for, for New York. I, I think it's a, a fantastic city to, to be out in of an evening. Um, sorry, my voice is really starting to go a bit weak this evening. Um, I think we've exhausted all, all the questions now, if there's, if there's nothing else uh, forthcoming. Um, we've sent you a little gift, by the way, to, to your, your practice in New York um, for, for oh. coming along tonight. Really appreciate you coming along. And thank you, uh, thank you so much for, for coming. Um, I'll end the recording there.